Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the YouTube home of Light on the Corner Church. We're so glad you've tuned in. Uh, my name is John Carn. I'm the pastor of this wonderful church called Light on the Corner Church. We are broadcasting today from, as always, from beautiful downtown Montrose, California. I want to say thank you to that band for that lovely rendition of Be Thou My Vision, which is a wonderful old Irish hymn. And... Uh, Appreciate it, fellas. And I would like to ask you to hit like and subscribe, which helps us put some wind in our sails and keep those cards and letters coming from all over the world. Good to see you today. Good to talk to you. We'll be in the New Testament today. We're going to dive right into the text, as always. Without the Bible, I don't have anything to say. And there are preachers out there who are very gifted at saying things that aren't even in the Bible, and I am not one of them. I don't have anything to say without dealing with the text. So there you have it. So if you're going to watch me, you're going to get the Bible into you. And that's really what you want, something that will stick to your ribs. The Bible. What an idea. All right. So we have been talking about you and the spiritual gift or gifts that God gave you. We looked at the list of gifts in Romans 12, and then a very different list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. We'll close this subject today by looking at Ephesians 4 and 1 Peter 4. Uh, both these two passages are short. Let's begin here. Jesus gave us 
special people. Jesus himself gave us special people. There are special people all around you. And Satan is scared to death that some of you might discover that very fact and then use your spiritual gift for helping the church. He doesn't want you to know anything about the gifts God gave you. And for goodness sake, the devil doesn't want you active and productive in the body of Christ. Martin Luther said, no man should be alone when he opposes Satan. The church and the ministry of the word were instituted for this purpose, that hands may be joined together and one may help another. If the prayer of one doesn't help, the prayer of another will. So said Martin Luther, and I, I quite agree. Well, before we go any further, let's pray. Holy Father in heaven, we ask today that you would convince us of our usefulness, our giftedness, and our uniqueness in the body of Christ. May we grasp the tragic waste of idleness in your church and for your kingdom. Open our eyes today to the exciting things that can be done through ordinary people like us, servants of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here is the spiritual gift list that Paul the Apostle gave to the Ephesian Christians. Here's what he said. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, and to prepare God's people in order to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, number one, and number two, and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 with verse 7 at the beginning. So, Jesus himself made some people apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some others pastors and teachers. Jesus gave us these special people to train us to do God's work. I don't want to skip over this. Jesus gave us these special people to train us to do God's work so that the church would be strong and functioning. The Bible says this training needs to continue until two things are accomplished. Number one, until all of us are unified in a full understanding of Jesus. And number two, until all of us become spiritually mature, having become all we were meant to be in Christ. That's why we have them. Okay, let's talk about this list. Number one, Jesus gave us special people. Let's describe these people briefly, shall we? First, apostles, Paul says. Apostles. The twelve apostles were men who were eyewitnesses to the life of Christ. They personally witnessed the fact that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. They were a special group of people that laid the foundation for the church. I might add there ones, beware of people who call themselves modern-day apostles. Next, prophets. We know about the famous Old Testament prophets, 
But did you know that Jesus also gave prophets in the New Testament to the church? For example, Luke chapter 2 speaks of Anna, the prophetess, who met Jesus at his baby dedication. Acts 21 mentions four daughters of Philip who were prophetesses. And also the prophet Agabus. Just be glad that your parents didn't name you that. Wonderful guy, though, the prophet Agabus, who prophesied Paul's arrest. And he was right. Well, these special people were gifts to the church. And here's something to remember about both Old and New Testament prophets. They were never wrong. Before the completion of the New Testament, God revealed his word and will through men and women with the gift of prophecy. And they were always right because they spoke in Jesus' name and by the power of his Holy Spirit. Next, Paul mentions evangelists. Evangelists. Jesus valued evangelists enough to give them as gifts to the church. Genuine evangelists can't stop talking about Jesus. The good news of his death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel. Evangelists love the gospel. They contend, fight, and die for the gospel. You know, when America was young, circuit-riding preachers were so relentless in their ministry evangelism mostly, that on stormy days there was a proverbial saying out west, there's nothing out today but crows and Methodist preachers. You know, um, speaking of evangelists, evangelists don't have to be like Billy Graham. You know, only Billy Graham was Billy Graham. Evangelists can be regular people, even quiet people. They are people who think like this. Lord, send me to one more. One more. One more soul. I have to reach one more lost person. Lost people matter to evangelists. May God raise up an evangelist in our church too. Next, pastor teachers. There are many different kinds of pastor. Some excel in administration. Some are great at the graveside or the bedside or when you have a problem or need counseling. Some are charismatic. Some are great in public, but then kind of awkward one-on-one. -on -one. But the church whose pastor can teach the Bible accurately without being boring has a real prize, I'll tell you. A humble pastor who can teach the Word of God accurately without being boring that's really something. And by the way, that's my prayer for myself. Paul calls these people gifts to the church, straight from Jesus. A shepherd who can help you understand the Bible is a gift, dear ones. I know that I have been marked forever by godly pastors who taught me. I thank God for them. My dad was one of them. One Faithful pastor can quietly change the world. Just one. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on to point number two. Jesus gave a special people. Jesus gave us special gifts. Perhaps you've noticed so far all the spiritual gifts I've mentioned have been provided for us by the Apostle Paul. But there's another shorter list, and it comes from the Apostle Peter. Here's what he says. Each one should use whatever gift 
he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 4. So there are many different ways to speak. And there are many different ways to serve. Most of the gifts involve speaking in some way or serving in some way. If Jesus gave you a gift to speak, then speak as one speaking the very words of God. Humbly, please. Jesus expects your gift to bear fruit. So if you are using what you think is your spiritual gift and everybody hates it and runs away from you, maybe you ought to think about you know, a different tack. Maybe that's not your gift. Maybe it isn't your gift to comment on the color combinations of the people in your congregation, what they're wearing. I don't know. It's just a thought. If Jesus gave you a gift to serve in some way, Serve in the strength and the power that God provides. There's a whole bunch of you that I know of who have the gifts to do things that I will never be able to do. It makes me feel so, so limited, but it makes me so grateful that you're there. Serve in the strength and power that God provides. That is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Humbly, please, because you can do things that other people can't. Serving, not hit and miss, not complaining, not with a sour look on your face, like the church owes you because you're serving, but serving in the power of God the grace of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, willingly, serving the one who saved your soul and gifted you with the Holy Spirit. This is how you change the world. Not by just attending church and then leaving, but by attending church and doing something to bless your brothers and sisters. Find a need and fill it. Find a hurt and heal it. You have all indeed received abilities from God. My question, dear ones, is simple. Do you love enough to serve? You don't have to preach a sermon or sing a solo, but I know this. God gifted you to do something. So what are you supposed to be doing? I don't know. Think about it. Try serving. Wash a dish or move a chair or bring a friend or water a plant or teach a class or clean a window, or round up some friends. Bring them with you to church. Put the van in evangelism. Fill up your vehicle. Sweep, lift, call, write, pray, give, welcome, serve. When it's not fun, and then do this, stay till the job is done. But why do we do all this? 
See how Peter closes. He says, So that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, the Corinthians were able to mess up everything, and they messed up the gifts that God had given them too. They thought that the gifts were all about them. Look at what I can do. Look at me. The Holy Spirit gave me the ability to do this. Don't you wish you had my gift? So glad I'm not the pastor at Corinth. But Peter sets it straight. Why do we do any of this? It's not for us. It's not for the applause. We do not serve for the applause. Sometimes we serve in obscurity. And we think nobody sees, but God sees. The applause is for someone else. I should tell you, at home we have a pet bunny. And I think the thing that he likes most in the world is applause. He is a diva bunny, I'll tell you. Don't be like our bunny. We don't serve for applause. We serve for the glory of Jesus Christ. That God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Do you see what this means? God is praised when you are faithful in using the gift he gave you. In the name of Jesus. So, God himself is very interested in your use of the tool that he put in your hand. You, dear ones, become a tool in God's hand. So I suggest that we all lend a hand. Once upon a time, there was a famous house builder and painter. After designing the homes, he would then build and paint them. That's a talented guy. As a painter... He was such an amazing artist that he didn't even need drop cloths. I can't imagine, because every painter needs a drop cloth. He had a steady hand, and he was finicky about using good brushes and quality paint. So there were no drips, just tight, trim lines in his houses. This craftsman always designed, built, and painted the homes all by himself with his own hands. But then, one day, he had a remarkable idea. As he was standing by one of his houses, he saw a bunch of kids walking home from the local elementary school. They were minding their own business, laughing and carrying their backpacks until he shouted at them, Hey, kids! And when they looked up, they were startled and awestruck because everyone in town knew about this guy and his amazing skills. And he asked them a surprising question. He said, how would you like to do some painting? What do you mean, they said. Well, I'll tell you what, he said. I'll give... I'll tell you what, he said. I'll give each of you a bucket of paint and a brush and you can paint my new house. You want to give it a try? For real, they said. And they squealed in delight and the painter nodded as he said, yep, for real. Cool, said the kids. And so he opened up the back of his truck and pulled out a load of brushes and paint cans and then he pried the cans open and they went to work and they started splashing paint on his garage door. They got paint on the sidewalk. Two. 
and some on each other. But they also got a lot of paint on the house. All different colors. Especially on the parts of the house that were under four feet high. As other kids came by on the sidewalk, they asked, can we do that too? And they joined in. In about an hour, most of the first floor was now covered with paint. And the house painter's neighbors came over after dinner and took it all in. What's going on, they asked. Another blurted out, look, I got to be honest, your house looks like a tornado ripped through the Sherwin-Williams store. I mean, what on earth were you thinking? Well, the house painter said, of course, I could have painted this house all by myself. But I've always built and painted houses in order to bring joy to others. So, based on that goal, this then really would be the most beautiful house I've ever made. Then dozens of their friends will want to come to this house. They'll bring their friends to show what they've painted. And each one will say, this is the home of the master painter and builder, but it's also our house. Because we had a part in it. Dear ones, in the same way, when God the Father, the master creator and painter of the world, pours out his Holy Spirit on his followers, he hands every single one of us a can of paint and a brush. And he says, now go to work. Use your gifts. And let's paint a beautiful house. For the world. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for inviting us to join with you in your work. May our hands be busy about the task you've given us so that God will be praised in the holy name of your Son, Jesus, even through our humble efforts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.